Today, Natalie is preparing a dinner for cool weather. First, there's winter squash soup with red peppers and mint. The main course is an elegant salmon with tomato cream sauce. It's complemented by tangy steamed Brussels sprouts and carrots with honey mustard sauce. For dessert, Natalie will make a cranberry crisp that can be transformed into a wonderful baked chutney. Natalie Dupree Cooks is made possible in part by Publix Supermarkets. Publix is pleased to support this and other quality public broadcasting programs. Hello, I'm Natalie Dupree, and before I start showing you how to make this lovely winter squash soup with red peppers and mint, I want to talk to you a little bit about your busy days, because that's what the theme of this whole series is about, and, and of my latest book. When you're really busy, you need to start thinking ahead for the whole week. For instance, if you can get all your onions chopped or sliced, you can choose which one you want, and you know it doesn't really always make a very, very fine difference. Get them chopped, sauteed, either in oil or butter, whichever your preference is. Measure out what you think one onion is. In other words, chop three or four or five onions and divide it into three, four or five. And then you'll measure that and for the rest of your life, that can be how much you think one chopped onion really is when it's cooked down. Uh, or you can just chop your onions ahead and leave them in the refrigerator or freeze them and then just pull them out and cook them as you need them. But to be really organized, if you know that you're going to use onion in two dishes like we are today, get it all cooked ahead. Why not cook it all at one time and divide it? So here I've got some chopped onion, and in this case it's got a little bit of garlic in it too, or could have. Um, actually, I'm going to add some to it in a second. And if, if the recipe says, for instance, like this one does, to cook the onion, garlic, and chili powder on, Get your onions almost all the way cooked and then add your garlic and your chili powder. But I'm just going to re remove some of the onion for another dish later on in the day. So then I'm going to add my garlic and my chili powder and let that cook just a little while longer. You always want to cook that chili powder some because you want to get rid of any of the rough edge that's on it. Now while that's cooking, you can go ahead and prepare your squash. And winter squash is usually the phrase that you use to talk about these thicker skin squashes that last longer in a cool place, maybe several weeks, or actually, you know, you can leave them sometimes much more than that, a month or more in a cool place. So you peel them. Now don't get yourself locked into thinking that you have to peel it whole, but cut it in half like you would a melon, and then go back and peel a wedge. Um, first let me show you how to get out the seeds. Here are the seeds. And I have also sort of cooked this a little bit in the microwave and then peeled it sometimes and that makes a difference. And just scoop out your seeds and get rid of those. And I'm afraid there's no real trick to this unless you do want to cook them a little ahead. Um, and I think the microwaves have really made cooking squash a lot, a lot easier just in general. Um, one of these halves would, of this butternut squash would be really nice. This is a butternut squash right here. An acorn squash would be nice in this recipe too. And over here is a calabaza, which is a Costa Rican squash. And we're seeing all these unusual squashes now, and we're seeing them at different times of the year because they're coming up from other countries. So now go ahead and get it, and let's just get this skin off of here, this peel off of here. And uh, it's, still a, it's still a little tricky to peel. It's not what I would call easy. It takes you a little bit of time until you get used to it. But do be sure to cut it in half or in wedges. And now just cut it roughly into one inch cubes. And of course that's not a cube there. We'll have to get it cut down a little bit more like that and like that. Obviously you just want it small enough that it's going to cook and it's really more of a half inch cube. Now. Um, you can peel and seed and chop tomatoes, or you can use these lovely canned tomatoes, which why not, why wouldn't you? And you can roast and seal and seed a red bell pepper 
Once again, that's something that you can do all at once. If you know that you're crazy about red bell peppers, particularly in the fall when they're cheap, like I am, then go ahead and roast a whole bunch of them at one time. And when we say roast, we really mean char. Run, put a whole lot of them onto a, a pan and run them into the oven under the broiler, or else when the grill is still heating from something else, throw them onto the grill at the tail end of the grill of the, of the coals. Get them really charred all over, peel them, and keep them in a jar of vinegar or a jar of oil once they're peeled and seeded and torn into strips. And then you'll have them forever. Or, of course, you can go ahead to the grocery store and buy these peppers, which are called roasted peppers. Uh, they're called home-style fancy sweet. And um, I think that they're well worth investing in and keeping on your pantry shelf. Now you cut them, and they could be pimentos as well. But go ahead and cut your, uh, you peel your pepper like this. The other reason for doing it is because it gets under your nails and it's really hard to clean out. So you might as well do them all at once uh, if you see that you're going to use them over a course of, of a week and peel them and seed them and chop them. Now that the onions are soft, go ahead and stir in your tomatoes. Reserve your tomato juice if you had any until you needed it. Stir in your tomatoes. Add your cubed squash. If you needed to speed up this whole dish, you could cook your squash in the microwave, but I think that you're better just adding it now and doing some other things. Uh, cook your tomatoes about five minutes, then add your squash and your roasted peppers. Here they are. And eyeball your, your uh, tomato juice and see if you need it. I think I'm going to, so I'm going to add it. Your chicken stock. and simmer it uncovered until the squash is tender, which is about 30 to 50 minutes. If you were desperate, you could cook that squash in the microwave and add it at this point. Now, you can chill the soup at this point up to three days. I mean, you don't have to do this all frantically at the last minute. And then reheat it just before continuing. If you need to thin the soup with more stock, you can. And you know you can always do that. And then season it with salt and pepper. I keep my salt. I don't know if you can see this. This is another of my pottery dishes by my friend Corey Lewis of Oxford, Mississippi. And um, I just keep my salt in a big container like this. Just be sure that people don't think it's sugar. And um, then I can just pull out what I need when I need it rather than have it in an ugly shaker or try to get to it. And then you serve it hot, garnished, um, and this is my beautiful bowl. Here it is right here. It's all cooked down. Ugh, so good. You know, this is almost a meal by itself, and that's one of the reasons why I'm showing it to you with this dish. Serve it hot, garnished with parsley and mint. It is delicious, delicious, delicious. I hope that you're all hungry for it while you're sitting there uh, watching this show. Now I have salmon with a tomato cream sauce. And a lot of people ask me about menu planning. And normally in a menu, you don't repeat an ingredient like tomatoes. But the, this uh, salmon dish has such a different finesse and such a different feeling and flavor that I thought you would like to see it in contrast to this. And you could actually serve this very easily. Uh, with your tomato squash soup because we debated it a lot. It was one of those great big kitchen de debates. Now, here's your salmon and you can seed it, you can skin it if you'd like. Skinning is kind of hard and if your butcher doesn't do it, well, it's not hard, it's just that you're afraid of it if you've never done it before. If you want to skin it, just go ahead and get yourself a little piece of the skin here. And the real trick to it is to getting a knife with a flat edge so that it will stay flat against the counter. If it's curved, um, say like that, then of course it would be harder to skin. So skin your salmon holding your knife right to the edge and all you're doing is just moving your knife just like that. I hope you can see that. I know it's hard. If I, I would, I don't think I can do it backwards to show it to you. But you see you're just pulling it like that, keeping the knife flat against and holding the holding the skin down and you just push it like that. Really what you're doing is just pushing the salmon off and that's the way you skin all fish. But you are, if you're afraid of it, don't do it. So place your salmon skin side down into your dish and uh, then 
let's see, I have to do something with these canned tomatoes. Put your onions in your large dish from over here uh, with the tomatoes. There we are. Somebody's written it up there for me. I got a little confused. And uh, put the salmon on top. You want to measure the thickness of your salmon because you always cook your salmon according to the thickness. Now you can cover this and refrigerate the whole thing with plastic wrap up to 24 hours and then just put it, return it to room temperature before continuing. So pour your lime juice over the fish. Here we are. Your cumin seed, salt and pepper to taste. And you have your um, tomatoes all around here. Cover it with aluminum foil and bake it in the middle of a 400 degree oven for 10 minutes to the inch of thickness of the fish, which in this case is about 20 to 30 minutes. The fish should still be firm when you remove it from the oven, and here it comes. Such vanity, I have one of those matching mitts with aprons again. Now you strain your juices into a heavy saucepan like I have here, and you you press it hard to extract as much flavor as possible. You're going to discard these, or if you really wanted to, you could just pop them right over into your soup. What would it matter? Now, add heavy cream and bring it to the boil and boil it down till it's reduced by half. And then cut the fish into your serving pieces and serve warm with the sauce. Or I have a favorite gadget that I, oh, here's one, but I have another one that opens up. Let's just put it on the dish here and serve you, show you how beautiful it is with this gorgeous sauce by reduction. See that little skin? Always cover it with a piece of wax paper to be sure it doesn't form a skin like mine did. Hello, I'm Linda Omart. Stains on our clothes from cooking and sometimes from sloppy eating and on our tablecloths and napkins from entertaining can be a real problem. Today, I'm going to demonstrate how to remove some common but difficult stains. But before I begin, I want to give you a few general tips for removing stains. Treat the stain as soon as possible. A uh, stain that is set is much harder to remove. Heat sets a stain, so don't wash and dry the fabric until the stain has been treated. Air out the fabric after you have treated it for the stain. If you do that and the stain doesn't come out, then you can try another uh, type of stain removal which might work. When laundering, use an extra one half cup of detergent. The first stain that I'm going to sh uh, tell you about is grease, which includes butter, margarine, oil, Vaseline, and things like that. We're using butter today. You need to pre-treat the stain with liquid shampoo, and put some on the back and on the front, rub it in. Once you've got a, a good paste of this liquid shampoo, then wash the uh, fabric in the hottest water and bleach that the fabric can take. And don't forget that extra half cup of detergent. A coffee stain must first be rinsed with cool water, which I've already done. Next, soak for 30 minutes in a mixture of all fabric bleach and warm water. Then launder, um, as we stated before. For a tea uh, stain, apply a spot lifter. There are several steps to this process, and so I've done some of them ahead of time. I applied the spot lifter, which was a spray-on, had to let it dry. Then as soon as it dries, sponge off the residue with a damp cloth and rinse out the spot lifter. Then make a solution of one-fourth cup hydrogen peroxide and a few drops of ammonia. Soak for five minutes in this solution, then rinse and launder. No matter how hard we women try, it's almost impossible not to get lipstick on our napkins. The first rule in removing a lipstick stain is do not rinse the stain. Apply a spot lifter and let it stand for one minute. Rinse it in warm water which we've already done, then soak for one hour in an enzyme pre-soak and launder. Chocolate desserts taste wonderful, but the stains are difficult to remove. The first thing you do is rinse in cool water, then apply a paste of liquid laundry detergent 
and all fabric bleach. Wait 30 minutes and wash in warm water. If that doesn't work, soak overnight in an enzyme pre-soak, then rinse and launder. The remedies I've given you are for washable fabrics. When dealing with non-washable fabrics, the best remedy is to take the item immediately to the dry cleaner, show them the stain, and tell them what it is, and let them do the rest. A few minutes ago, I said the wrong name of this squash. This is a butternut squash, and this is a buttercup squash, and I just kind of blanked when I was saying both names right in a row. But this is also called a, a turban squash, and you can see that it kind of looks like a turban. So I like that name a little bit better. I don't think you'd blank going from butternut to buttercup if you said butternut to turban squash. And it's the same thing. You just scoop out the seeds, and I could put them in that bowl there, but I think I'll just move it. All right. Moving right ahead, let's go on to our Brussels sprouts and carrots with honey. And if you thought that the honey was going to be too sweet for your palate uh, with that lovely salmon dish, you can omit the honey from this dish. It's still a very nice dish. Now, Brussels sprouts are one of those things that people are real leery of cooking, and I, I have no major objection to the frozen kind. Um, but what you want to do is just cut off the edge and cut a little X in them. People do, that haven't had good Brussels sprouts, good, ooh, Brussels sprouts, but I love them. So cut a little X in them. Here we go. And that's so that you do get a good Brussels sprout and that the inside is cooked as well as the outside. And that way it won't be, uh, you won't have to overcook them and get them squashy. Now these carrots, you can peel and uh, skin them yourself, just scrape off the outside of them. But you know, they're selling them now almost perfectly scraped so you don't need to. And put, them, put the carrots in the steamer over boiling water and cover them and steam them about 10 to 15 minutes until they're just getting tender. And then add the Brussels sprouts and cover and steam them covered about seven minutes. If you want to cook, add the Brussels sprouts and keep them green, then you have to keep the cover off so it's going to take you a little bit longer until they get all crisp and tender. And then put the vegetables, strain them into a large bowl. And while they're steaming, you mix together your melted butter, your Dijon mustard, here we go, your honey, and some chopped cilantro. I'm going to show you that in a second. And chopped celery leaves. Those are sort of optional. Both cilantro and celery leaves have an enormous personality. Uh, and it, it's kind of like um, putting uh, Jeff Smith and Graham Kerr in the same room. You know, you may decide that you don't want one or the other at the, all at the same time. Oh, they're both, although they're both wonderful all by themselves. Uh, but I like them both together. They're, they're both wonderful, wonderful personalities. If you don't watch their shows, I recommend them highly, just like I do my friend Martin Yan. What we like, a lot of people think that the television chefs are competitive. And in fact, the actuality is that most of us are very good friends, uh, know each other well, and go to um, cooking school meetings together, and like the International Association of Culinary Professionals, which is really one of the top culinary associations in the, in the world because it's an international association. That was my celery leaf. And celery leaves are much stronger than celery is itself, so you have to be careful. So slice it down, chop it, and here's the cilantro which also has a big, big personality. You may want to leave it out of a dish if you'd like, and that's okay too. Um, people either love it or hate it. Take it off of the stalk, because the stalk of the cilantro and parsley is the opposite of celery. Celery stalk is uh, less strong than the seeds, um, and cilantro and parsley stalk is stronger than the leaves. So nothing's ever the same. You can't always make a fixed rule about leaves versus stalks. And then you just season this to taste with your salt and pepper. And uh, go ahead and toss this dressing with your still warm vegetables. 
But you can do this dressing, obviously, ahead of time. And if you need to reheat it a little bit in the microwave, um, why not? And the same thing with the vegetables. Uh, go ahead and let it sit 15 minutes for, or so for the flavors to develop. The nice thing about this dish is that you can serve it um, at room temperature, cold or hot. So if you're doing this with the fish, you don't have to worry about everything being hot at the same time because you might feel a little pressure about that fish. And it makes a lovely, colorful salad if you serve it chilled. Let's chill it for at least a couple of hours or even overnight. And then serve it on lettuce leaves and top it with some toasted slivered almonds. Now what we have over here is a cranberry crisp. And it'll serve about eight people. Um, cranberries, you know, are a seasonal fruit and you have to be careful to freeze some. Whenever Thanksgiving comes around, freeze a whole batch of them. I freeze 20 or 30 um, packages of them so that I'll have them for all year round. Um, but this year I ran out of them so I had to call Ocean Spray and beg them to send me some for the show, which they were happy to do. But I do normally just keep them freezing, frozen. Now, you want to peel and core and slice five Granny Smith apples. I'm going to show you this if I have time. And then grate some orange peel and chop or grate some fresh ginger. This is part of a hand of fresh ginger. I'm going to show you all this in a second. And then toss them together in this bowl with two cups of, let's see, two cups of whole cranberries, a cup of sugar, your ginger, two tablespoons of your grated orange peel, a tablespoon of your chopped ginger with a tablespoon, and set it all aside. So let's just toss this. Now, if you made a double batch of this, you could use half of it for your cranberry crisp and half of it for a chutney that you could keep in the refrigerator. I might just chop this apple for a chutney. You could keep it in your refrigerator and serve it with, say, pork or something like that that would really give it uh, a little bump up to your pork. So you can do double your recipe, save your time, get a buttered dish, separately mix together a cup of quick oats, a half a cup of brown sugar. You know what it's called when you put some sugar or a flour or something in wax paper like that and measure it ahead of time, which I hope you always do? It's called a spill, and then you go ahead and add it. A cup of chopped pecans, and of course you could buy the pre-chopped chopped kind, but then you'd have to chop them a little bit more. I'm going to show you some pecan halves, although many people think it's a sin to use pecan halves and then chop them, and I'm one of those. So do buy the cheaper variety that's pre-chopped rather than your gorgeous pecan halves, even though I'm going to show them to you. Now, you spread your apple mixture in a buttered dish, and as you know, I butter it with this um, buttered wrapper from the refrigerator, or I have no objections to the spray kind of oil you know, that you get in a can. And then press your oat mixture on top. This needs to be a little moister. And um, mix together. You should have, I should have pressed it on top first and then mix together of my vanilla and the half a cup of melted butter and poured that over the top. I'll just add my vanilla now because I forgot it. This is just as easy. No reason why you couldn't mix it ahead. It's just not the way I wrote it in the book. There we go. It's very nice. But you could get it a little smoother the other way. And bake it at 325 degrees for an hour. Let it sit about 10 minutes before serving, and it will also freeze. And as I said, if you take out the topping, that is the brown sugar and the oats and the vanilla and the butter, you have a wonderful baked chutney for pork or poultry. I'm just going to be showing you this real quick, uh, which is this ginger. I just want to show you how to slice it, leave the peel on, and you can chop it. Or you can put it in the food processor and grate it. This is a fabulous meal. You can fix most of it ahead of time and then just cook your um, fish at the last minute. I hope you're going to enjoy it. Natalie's dinner for cool weather features winter squash soup with red peppers and mint. The main course is an elegant salmon with tomato cream sauce, complemented with tangy steamed Brussels sprouts and carrots with honey mustard sauce. 
For dessert, cranberry crisp, which can be transformed into a wonderful baked chutney. Someone asked me the other day just exactly what was reducing a liquid. It's not exercising a liquid. The purpose is to concentrate the flavor and to thicken the liquid. How long it will take depends on the intensity of the heat and the size of your pan. That is, the width of the pan and the amount of the liquid. You should definitely try to use a heavy pan for all of your reductions because that'll give you an even heat distribution and it'll prevent burning. If the heat is low, it's gonna take a lot longer to reduce, it's logical. Stock can be reduced on high heat, real boiling, boiling, boiling it away. But cream-based sauce need a lower heat because of the risk of scorching. It's all logical. You can use a higher heat if you have the time to stir constantly when you're reducing cream. If the pan's shallow and wide, the water in the sauce will boil off faster than from a narrow one. So if you're in a hurry and don't mind, mess and don't mind messing up a second pan, put the liquid into a shallower water pan or even two. Natalie Dupree Cooks is made possible in part by Publix Supermarkets. Publix is pleased to support this and other quality public broadcasting programs.